Hello, people. Sincerely, hello. Positively, happily, hello from the Kelly Writers House in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. Um, on a day that some some people in the USA thinks they we believe that uh, participatory democracy still has a shot. Anyway, sorry. Started with politics. That's the end of politics. Zip it out. Button it up. Let's talk about poetry. Poetry, politics. Mm, we're not there yet in week three, but we could get there. We could get there. Anyway, let's start over. Hello, everybody. This is Al, <laughs> and I'm joined here by some of my best pals in the whole world, and we are ready to talk with you in the next hour and 15 minutes or so, live, coming to you live from Modpo HQ. Uh, I have a couple of announcements, then I'm going to say hi to our, our friends here, and we're going to get started. You can call us at 610-616-3208. You can post to the special subforums thread that we have set up, and there are already some people doing that. And who among us is going to be looking at that? Anna? I got Twitter. Okay, Anna's got Twitter. Jess doesn't have a machine. I can do forums too. <laughs> how, about, how about if Lily does Twitter, because she's got the device for it, and Anna, Sounds good. forums, yeah. okay. Why do I have a Okay. And Lily, Twitter, okay. Yep. Uh, a couple of announcements, and then we'll get started. Uh, we have some people, uh, some fabulous TAs. I see Max there <laughs> joining us from afar. Uh, week three is kind of a favorite. And so we can't wait to get started. First, an announcement. Um, the Los Angeles area, Southern California people, are meeting this coming weekend. Uh, Paige Pulsine, who's a great, great, great CTA, longtime mod poer. We adore Paige. She's also a teacher and someone who's been pretty, uh, pr you know, in the avant-garde of teaching online. They're meeting this Saturday. They have a series of meetups at various places in Southern California. Uh, this Saturday, September 28th at noon at Made Coffee, 107 West Amaridge Avenue in Fullerton. This is the first meetup I know of in Fullerton, California. So if you want to find out more about this particular meetup or other SoCal meetups, you just go to the discussion forums under meetups and study groups and check out Southern California Meetups 2019. And that's just one of many meetups that have been going on. Um, Look, this is an online, open online course, so-called massive open online course. There are currently about 32,000 people enrolled. Looks like we have about 12,000 people who are active this week. Um, that's a lot of people, but it becomes personal if you plan to meet up or if you join an online study group if your location is far flung, and we're all about that. We're also all about the office hours, which is a chance for you to talk to us one at a time. Um, Announcement number two, the Modpo crew will be going to Boston. We have a meetup on Thursday, October 10th in the evening. Uh, that will be our webcast that week. Come and join us if you're in the Boston area, if you're traveling to Boston. And Saturday, October 12th at the home of a dear friend of ours, Lisa New, who is the creator and lead teacher of um, Poetry in America, another MOOC on another uh, channel, another network. It's called uh, edX. Um, and if you're interested in either of those two events, write to us at modpo at writing.upenn.edu, modpo at writing.upenn.edu. And also there's going to be a poem talk at the Woodbury Poetry Room uh, at Harvard University. And if you tell us you'd like to come to that, it's on Friday, October 11th. And we can get you in. We can, you know, get you a pass or something so you can get in Lamont Library at Harvard and join us, be an observer. And Anna doesn't even really know it, but she's one of the poem talkers. What? Yeah. We're going to be talking about Tanya Foster's uh, wonderful kind of experimental haiku, which is appropriate this week. Um, okay, my last announcement is really is praise of Jess and a kind of set up of our week. We will go from my praising Jess to um, a kind of uh, discussion, I think, I hope, of a question that Jess asks in her office hour, and to which Kim Harrison, I think a somewhat new Mod Poer, replied. So Jess didn't just say, and this is not meant to be chastising anybody, uh, or any other TA, but Jess opened up her office hour saying, here's what I'm thinking, and then got a bit of a response. Um, Jess says, uh, we encounter the so-called ordinary objects in the poems of this week, uh, stripped of vagueness, made to shimmer with a certain kind of clarity or exactitude. 
Um, Jess says, I think a lot about the ordinary in my own work, and I'm excited to think about it with you. And then Jess refers to Lynn Haginian, who's a chapter 9.1 poet, week eight, um, in an essay that Lynn wrote called A Common Sense. And the quote from it that Jess renders here is, the quotidian consists not of things, but of effects playing over the surface of things, which is a great take on imagism that makes imagism a whole lot more relevant to contemporary poetry than it would otherwise be. And Kim Harrison shows up and says, thank you so much for a great thinking prompt. And it really was a great prompt, Jess. Um, and so Lin Kim says, I don't know Lynn Haginian. I'll definitely check it out. I'm also fascinated by how the ordinary can be. I'm going to use the word beautiful, even more so, actually, the older I get, says Kim Harrison, and see the world in different ways myself. And then what might seem a non sequitur is not. I'm finding it so interesting coming to these poems and lines of thought in my mid-40s with two kids, pets, a house in a village. It's a very different space. Mm. And then Kim responds, that wasn't enough, responds again, I wish I'd been able to get here to your office hour sooner, so interesting. I was already thinking about a poem I'd written a little while ago, and I'm workshopping with my poetry group that is about very ordinary things. I'm so inspired now, thank you, Jess, uh, to rework it based on the learnings this week in ModPo and hopefully post it to that thread for the poem inspired by week X. In other words, um, people are submitting their own poems. Aside from praise for Jess, um, it's a great prompt. And praise for Kim Harrison, who, you know, there's no typical mod poer. Mod poers are intergenerational, m you know, multicultural, multilinguistic, uh, in all respects diverse. But Kim is, it's kind, Kim's experience is sort of typical in that people come to mod po in a different moment of life. They're not in traditional educational settings. They're trying to write. They're trying to find time to write. And they encounter week three, and they realize that week three is about the little things, seemingly little things, that, as Jess puts it, shimmer. And what's so great is that Kim is engaging with Jess. It's an office hour with one person in it, and that is absolutely fantastic. That's what Mod Poe is all about. So while that, my various friends are thinking about a response to that issue that Jess raised in relation to your new thinking about week three, I introduce everybody to give them time to think about it. Uh, we have Jason here. Sorry to go first to someone you'll have to move the uh, camera for. Hi, good morning, Jason. Hello, good morning, Hello. Al. How are you? There he is. Wow, looking at in the sunshine. <laughs> He's shimmering, people. No ordinary object, he. That's great. <laughs> uh, and Jess, the aforementioned, hi. Hello. Davey, hello. What's up, Al? Davey gave me some water in the this <laughs> mug, this. Talk about objects. I don't know that this is an object without the this. I'm a right-handed plunker. The, uh, the linguistic theory of the thing that we're talking, we're not talking about this in Mod Po. We're talking about this, that thing. Uh, thank you, Davey. How are you? I'm doing well, Al. How are you? No, you did it again. Stop doing that. <laughs> I answered your question, Al. I know, but you're so modest. You always turn it back <laughs> onto other people. Tell us how you're doing. I'm... Uh, Busy thinking about Jess's question. Oh, the, you did it again! Answer. No, I, you're incredible. No. Talk about yourself sometime. But humans are relational. Okay, <laughs> boy, you are incredible. No, you're the Teflon TA. I think you are. <laughs> Lily, good morning. Hey, Al. Anna, hello. Hey, Al. Amber Rose Johnson. Hello. A R J, to me. Amaris, good morning, Amaris. You're there somewhere. Good morning. Hi, it's early Hi. out there. Sorry, 7, 10 okay. a.m. <laughs> Dave Poplar in Arizona. Good Dave, morning. you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Is it 7, 10 or 8, 10? It's 7, 10. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Erica mm -hmm. Kaufman, it's 10, 10. Hi. Hi, Al. Hey, good morning to you. It's good to see you. Gabe, I think good. it's uh, 9, 10. Hey, good morning. Hey, everybody's got coffee. And Max, 910 also. Also 910. Hello. All right. So I, didn't, I don't think I missed anybody. Let's, what kind of response? We're going to go with hands <laughs> if in, the, in, the, in the whatever it's called, the hangouts. Oh, I lost them all. 
Chris is there. There they are. Uh, raise your hand or wave at me if you want to respond to Jess's thing about ordinary objects. Anybody here in the room have a thought? Davey first. So um, I'm cheating a little uh, because uh, Jess's thought puts me in mind of um, uh, a book that is a key book for thinking about the ordinary. Uh, Michael Warner's *The Trouble with Normal Sex, Politics, and the Ethics of Queer Life*. I'm going to read you a sentence. It's actually two sentences uh, by way of answering Jess's question. Those sentences are, nearly everyone wants to be normal and who can blame them if the alternative is being abnormal or deviant or not being one of the rest of us. Put in those terms, there doesn't seem to be a choice at all. And so something that's lovely, Jess, about the question that you raised is that it gets us to the week three poems and the tension that on the one hand, we have a uh, increasing sense of a interest in engaging in normativity or a stress of feeling like um, readers, people should be engaging in some sort of social normativity, and at the same time, uh, an increased ability in these poems to realize how weird objects are, and to use the weirdness of objects as a place from which to refuse a structure of normativity. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about ordinariness, I think about the normal and the non-normal or non-normative as tensions that relate both to people and to objects. Mm -hmm. Such a great start on this conversation. I wonder if... Um, Someone, it would be helpful for me, guys, if I could see everybody in the Hangouts, but I, I don't know what's happening with that. I think when we get a view of everybody, I lose them. Anyway, um, I'd love, maybe I'll just cold call somebody. Um, Gabe, um, looking back on your, your first encounter with Imagism and thinking about this discussion now, um, what would you say? What have you learned about Imagism? How is Imagism relevant to us? Um, Davey and Jess are both arguing for, I think in Jess's term, shimmering, arguing for a, a, a less supposedly objective view of the thing as described in a poem. That move would make it more relevant to contemporary poetry. Gabe, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I would say that I definitely don't trust imagism very much um, in the sense that I don't trust its own goals set out by it to like present an object in some kind of pure distilled way. And I think not trusting imagism is really productive in the sense that you can get a lot out of thinking about its style, its goals, um, and it's like representational politics if you don't believe in it. Um, and I, th I think that hasn't really changed for me as we've talked about it. I think I just get more in on that. But what I think I appreciate about, appreciate about imagism is I actually feel like a lot of these lines really reverberate um, in these ways that feel very impressive. Uh, and I think influence a lot of the poets that I care about later on in the century. So I think about like the ending of, um, oh gosh, the, the bottle, um, which is the name of the poem I'm now like blanking Between on. Between walls. Between that walls, yeah, I think about the that hospital bottle. hospital where nothing it, will like, grow. Life it's fingers. such a potent little image. Um, yeah. And I think actually to say that an image is potent maybe already goes against their hopes and dreams totally. for their poems. Totally. Good. Um, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Uh, not really imagist in any sense. If you broke down one or two of the 13 pieces, you then would have something like imagism behind it. But cubism is not at all. Cubism is more about the shimmering, you know, the not the non-exact. Mm. Because if you just admit, I mean, Pound would have insisted there's one way of looking at uh, faces in a crowd at a, met a, a Parisian metro. Um, Stevens is already beyond that. I'm sure that as soon as Pound uttered the statement, he too was beyond it. Um, so let me tell. Let me just say wh what the poems are in the main syllabus, and then I'll ask um, maybe Anna then Jason, then Erica, to pick out uh, any of the poems and briefly say how that might relate to the, to the prompt that Jess started us out with. And I'll also put out the word again that we are here, if you want to call us, at 610-616-3208. And the second caller is going to get a copy of the amazing, beloved Julia Block's uh, book called Valley Fever. Copy for the second Caller 610-616-3208. Main syllabus poems. HD, two poems, sea rose and sea poppies. Uh, pound in a station of the metro and this sort of unimportant but uh, thought-provoking, discussion-provoking poem called The Encounter from his book Cathay. Uh, Stevens, 13 Ways of Looking at Blackbird. Williams, uh, Between Walls, This Is Just to Say, and Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, we put that, we put Marcel Duchamp 
uh, and the fountain, which is the upside down urinal in there. Uh, Williams, the rose is obsolete. Holy cow, talk about shimmering. That's not an, uh, uh, an image's poem at all. Williams, portrait of a lady. Another Duchamp, and that is nude descending a staircase, which is sort of related to the portrait of a lady problem. And then lots and lots in Mod Pope Plus. Lots of Ray Armentrout, which I think might have been behind Gabe's comment about the way in, yeah, okay, the way in which imagism comes forward. Uh, Amy Lowell, some more pound, uh, lots of Ray Armentrout, including a, a poem we like to talk about, anti-short story, more HD. T.S. Eliot, well, there's one little thing about T.S. Eliot. <laughs> um, Hugh McDermott, this is a new piece. Uh, the Snowman by Stevens, lots of others. Peter Gizzi, and a whole section on Japanese neo-imagism, and Marianne Moore. So um, I think, who did I call on for this? I've forgotten. I think, Anna, I think Anna, Jason, and then Erica. A couple of people in the forums are asking, because uh, they tuned in a couple minutes late, if you could sort of restate the question at issue for the, I, good of, uh, I guess. for the good of the group. You want to take a shot at it? Because I summarized it or even quoted it. You want to move the mic close to you? Sure. Actually, I'll, you have my words here, so I'll, I'll refer to them. Um, yeah, to, to state it briefly, um, my prompt was just to think about, uh, I guess, the status of the ordinary object in the Imagist poem insofar as um, the idea there was that the object would be um, stripped of vagueness. Um, and yeah, again, I'm kind of, I'm borrowing that word shimmer from Lynn Higinian, um, made to shimmer with a, with a certain kind of, of clarity. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that, um, as somebody already said, there, there isn't an objective uh, me means of shimmering and that mm -hmm. there might be uh, more space for, for vagueness there. Thank you for, for restating that. Anna, any of the poems that I mentioned, uh, a good way of focusing the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the this week's poems, I feel it's helpful to just say this up front, are sort of split into the images poems and also like just the group of Williams poems that we read. Um, I just know there's sometimes like a little bit of confusion of reading some of those later Williams poems as images when like they're not necessarily. Right, um, the rose is obsolete. For right, instance. but like the Earl, the imagist Williams yes. that's collected in that first batch of the chapter two point. Like between walls. Exactly, yeah. Um, chapter two point one. Um, I would argue between walls is a is a really great example because it's a, a an object that literally shimmers. Right, it's an object that actually does catch the poet's eye as he's looking down. I always assume he's looking down. Probably from, he, he would take a cigarette break and a coffee break on an exterior um, roof, sort of an yeah. unexplored roof area of the hospital, the back wings, and then look down. And look down, into yeah. Into a no, no person's space. Right. Right, one of those spaces that you've always been interested in, which is like nobody can get there, but somehow there's stuff down there. Yeah. Yeah. And Highways do the same thing. Sure, and and the stuff that's there in this case is a broken piece of a bottle that catches the light, and suddenly that becomes equal to the subject of poetry, in the in a way yeah. that uh, resists or rejects the idea that poetry can only ever be about yes. big ideas, big questions, big you know yes. love or war or truth or you know capital T sort of themes. Yeah, I'm sleepless. So maybe my feeling very emotional about this is just that. But Dr. <coughs> Williams, um, surrounded by a bunch of MDs who really thought they could do, m men mostly, almost entirely, who could heal absolutely anybody with their incredible 19th century positivistic uh, medicine. And of course, what they did is they butchered people mostly. Um, Williams is out there on a, on a cigarette break and he sees life down there in the modern crap and he says to, he renews his sense of being a doctor, which is to, you know, broken people are broken people. Like, we can't, there's no miracles here. And so there's an aura, Gabe, there's an aura around the object. It's never, it was never just a little piece of glass. Uh, he invested all kinds of promises and possibilities of modern life if we just see some beauty in the broken glass. <laughs> Sorry, I, I said the word Gabe just because I don't know you're up. You're like filling I'm the screen. The cat walked by. Oh, there's a cat. Hi, oh, sorry. This is the cat named Broken. Hi, Broken. <laughs> sweet, sweet Broken. Anyway, thank, thank you, Anna, 
Um, uh, who was like Jason? What are your thoughts about this? Let's see. Um, first, my thought is when you're pointing to the this mug, <laughs> that I'll do it. Go ahead and yeah. <laughs> it's that. It's a by naming something by pointing to naming something is to to point to it and creates a relationship between the speaker and the object in which there is a shimmer there is something happening between an unnamed, unseen object and a witnessed object. You are a fucking genius. Can I stop you there? There's what, a, you, an, an amazing post in the forum. Before you read the amazing post, I just want to comment on yeah. what, what the genius is in what you just said. Um, and this is sort of the, your wisecrack about relationality earlier. <laughs> right? So this is inert unless we make... If we, make an, if, if we come... To, if we surround it with some aesthetic goal or intention or life, we, there's a relationship. And even in the most simple, de seemingly simple denotative gesture, that's a relationship. And that is, that's the shimmer. Like, mm -hmm. I really want to engage with this thing, right? Sort of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I said you're a fucking genius because you had a way just now in the Jason way of just of saying something that, that's implicit in the week's work. But to stress what, um, what ModPo is all about in its meta-institutional and meta-pedagogical urgency of doing this with the engagement of communities around the poetry to celebrate the gesture which has a lot of shimmering about it that has almost nothing to do with the object that would sit inert. Or to put it another way, Williams had to bring his fairly resistant notion of medical science to the broken glass in order to create the magic. Sorry for that word. Anyway, do you want to read the post? And then I want to turn to Erica. Sure. Um, and we have someone on the phone, I believe. Uh, the post is from Layla Amar. Oh, Layla. And she says, Salam. I just want to tell you that I am capable of forgetting this poem. I keep Which trying, one? the apparition of these faces in the crowd. Yeah, in the metro. Right. And she writes, petals on a wet black bow. We could possibly suggest a different story. The metro is the country where people are driven like a flock and have no saying or objection in the choice of the destination. But from time to time, some few individuals stand out from the crowd, raise their voice, and speak without fear. They are heroes. Oh, damn. <laughs> OK. Um, wow, Layla, thank you. Erica, I don't know if you heard Layla's comment enough or can spontaneously respond, but you probably had something else you wanted to say, and I would love to hear it. And then we're going to go to the phone. Um, Layla's comment is extraordinary, and I don't know that I want to um, add anything to it because it's it's just wonderful. Can I pose uh, it as a I question would... for you, Erica? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I pose it mm -hmm. as a question? I mean, Layla's yeah. basically saying, what would happen if we, if we pushed forward into this contemporary era of greater um, listening and inclusiveness than Pound was ever capable of, mm -hmm. and we turned the so-called genius, the modernist genius, of observing the faces in a crowd in a way that he did, uh, and we turned it slightly forward so that the faces in the crowd who are disembodied actually have voices that can speak back, right? It's sort of the difference between the old lecture on one hand and the uh, ridiculously globally interactive webcast. What if, uh, what if that imagism actually, that one, one could actively in the art speak back to it? Those are the brave voices that didn't even have a chance in the metro as observed, but they all had places to go and they were, they were you, does that make any sense to you? And I'm sorry to derail what you were going to say otherwise. No, it, does, it makes a lot of sense to me. And it also, one thing I always think about with the imagists is, um, and you know, this might be sort of dated as far as theory goes, but I think about um, 
Bill Brown, who's writing about earlier American literature, but the idea of um, the problematics of the significant thing, I might be screwing up what he talks about, but um, basically the idea that when you take something that's a thing or, or an object and the writer is putting meaning into it, it raises a whole new set of questions for the reader and we need to be really attentive to the set of questions. And I wonder if the impulse that you were alluding to is that by really pushing ourselves to ask the questions that dig into these images and the imagists, um, if that's if that's one way to surface the other voices that we might not hear. Yeah, thank you, beautifully put. Um, we're gonna take the phone call, or I'm gonna ask for um, Amber Rose, Dave, and Max to respond to whatever it is, if you don't mind. So who's the caller, Chris? Hi, uh, we have Philip Drexler calling okay, today. Okay, great. And we're he's great. on. Okay, hi, Philip. Good morning. Good morning, Al. Good to hear your voice this time. And <laughs> likewise. Oh, that's right. Last time you called, we were mute. Um, do you have a question, Phil? And then we're going to uh, ask you to hang up and listen to the response uh, so that others can call. Uh, before I ask the question, I have to give a shout-out to Anna because last year she uh, told us about Read a Poem to Children Day, and it's that time again this week, so I'll be reading children uh, poetry at the Austin State Hospital this afternoon. Fantastic. So let's give snaps to Anna for publicizing that great event. Yeah, there's some snaps here for Anna and also for you, Phil. And Michael Rothenberg. Right. And, and Michael Al. Rothenberg, who's, who's organized this thing yeah. nationally. Great. Thank you, Phil. Okay, uh, fire away your question, well, Philip. So anyway, my question is about the poem and the poet whose name and title I can't recall, but you'll get it by the line. Okay. Uh, she talked about uh, the high-sounding interpretation and uh, that some of them are useful and some of them are derivative. Oh, um, yeah, uh, this is Marianne Moore. Uh, that's the, it. The, the poem Poetry. Yes, sir. Jess that's gets credit one. for that. Um, I thank you, Phil, for asking the question. Will you hang up so someone else can call and listen for the answer? Thank you, Phil. Okay, Have well, a great week. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Well, that's a Modpo Plus poem, and I just cold called three people who probably aren't <laughs> up on it. Wait, I, what, what, Marianne Moore and Modpo Plus. There's a. Re uh, interested in us talking about Marianne Moore's poetry. Okay. Can, uh, can we, let's, for those of you who have access to Mod Po Plus, I'll read the first couple of lines and we'll just, we'll riff on it a little bit uh, and then we'll move on to the tweets and the discussion <coughs> forums. So, um, Lily, will you look for some tweets yep. that will work? Got and some Anna. Ready to go. Okay, great. So let me just um, go to more in the syllabus. This is Mod Po Plus. I have it up, Ali. I'm going to do what, it. I've got it. Okay. What, what uh, Anna and I went to the Rosenbach Museum, we uh, and we had a great session. We did some really fun videos there, and that's what Phil is talking about. Um, I'll just read the first stanza, and then we'll talk about it. So I think Amber Rose, you're just this is like random, spontaneous, right? <laughs> it begins. It's called poetry. It begins. I too dislike it. <laughs> there are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, <laughs> one discovers that there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. That's pretty cool. Would you move up to the mic and say anything in response to that? So, po I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers that there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Yeah, um, all right, well, um Actually, hearing that, it makes me think about Amiri Baraka's very problematic poem um, about what poems, I don't know, like I want poems that have teeth. He mm -hmm. says a lot of other things, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can appreciate this and um, I can appreciate this as sort of like a, a critique of poetry just for the sake of poetry or just for the sake of wordplay. Sure. Um, 
with uh, kind of coming in sort of wanting an urgency, wanting a poem to do something or mm. to have some or change. Or to solve your problem. Or, or to solve your problem. Your pain, right? right, alleviate you of your pain, make you, you know, eliminate your negative feelings or whatever mm. it is. Mm. Um, but then coming in with that sort of frustration, then this other thing right. can emerge, right which is sort of like the uh, an, an appreciation for words that can sort of bear witness yeah. more than they're supposed to solve a problem. Oh, that's so well put. Mm. That's so well put. And, and it really puts us in mind, I'm going to turn to Max in a second, puts us in mind of um, Williams and others who said, um, don't tell me that if I give you a poem, it's like giving you flowers. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. I don't do flowers. Right, enough of that. Down with that old stuff. Um, Can I maybe add one other thing please, out quickly? Of course, yeah. I'm also thinking of Audre Lorde, who said poetry is the quality, um, the quality of light through which we can scrutinize our lives. Mm. Um, and just thinking of it's poetry medium. as we're thinking about that shimmering, right? Oh. Yes. Like poetry being a kind of light which might not change what you see, but make you see it sort of differently. It's a medium rather than a thing in itself. Yeah. It's a way of seeing the world. So well put. Thank you. Um, Max and Dave, any thoughts on this question of, you know, maybe you have to hate poetry in order to get to it at some point, <laughs> Max? Um, well, this, this poem is interesting because it's, it stands a little bit apart from the rest of the metapoetic canon that we have <laughs> kind of assembled here in Modpo. Um, usually our meta poems are, are somewhere on the spectrum from like, uh, inquisitive or like, I don't know, agnostic about poetry in general to like celebratory. Um, and so it's rare to, to see a poem or to have included here a poem that at least opens with this stance of, of skepticism or of, of trivializing poetry, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, even though it is just a stance and over the course of the poem, uh, she uh, in fact demonstrates how poem, uh, poetry is more important than she right first let on, it's a bit of a straw man thing. Um, and I guess it kind of also speaks to just the, how slippery a slope meta poetry is in a good way. Uh, when you start, when you start going down that path, you kind of, you can't really escape it, even if your, your conceit or, or your, your gambit is to, to write this kind of like anti meta poem or like critical meta poem, you still right. wind up just writing a meta poem that's sort of recognizable as meta poetry. Right. Yes. Um, I want to turn to Dave Poplar. Thank you, Max. Uh, Moore used to read this poem, usually as an encore uh, at her readings. And what an effective thing that is, because she's got a room filled of people who are there to see the great Marianne Moore, especially later in her career. And basically she's saying, I don't like this any more than you do. You've been sitting here for an hour listening to me go on, but I don't like poetry either. So let's see what there is. Um, Dave Poplar, thoughts on this? There's one section of the poem I like uh, especially. Uh, a lot, where it, it says, these things are important, not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said for all of us, that we do not admire what we cannot understand. Hmm. And that, uh, in a lot of ways, reminds me of my own uh, experience uh, when I first came to poetry, which was, uh, you know, after practicing law for a while, so my brain was kind of in its own groove. So I had a problem understanding a lot of it and uh, getting into that perspective. And sometimes it felt like I was sitting in class in English 88, listening to a lot of people give highfalutin interpretations, talking about poetry. And I almost uh, was, was confused about even I, if I was even on the right poem, it was as if everybody was in a conspiracy to talk about something that was just downright silly and I couldn't understand what was going on, but uh, it was because I really just didn't understand it yet. I hadn't yet been able to uh, understand, accept that perspective. So it took, it took some years for me, for the most part, to get into it, but ultimately I, I did come to understand it. So uh, that idea that we cannot um, admire, what we cannot understand, right. Uh, right. really resonates with me. Um, I, thank you, Dave. It puts me in mind of how all a, a, a cue to Lily and Anna to pick out maybe two or three tweets and two or three comments to throw out on the table, and then we'll get some responses Great. to it. Um, but uh, apropos, while you're looking, apropos of Dave's comment, I think that one of the problems with Modpo is that tens and tens of thousands of people enroll 
And then once they get through the first week, life gets in the way, so we can't, there's nothing we can do about that. People have great goals and intentions of being involved in a 10-week run-through. But also some of it is they see our conversations and see them as high-toned and highfalutin at the beginning and get turned off by the kind of discourse alienation that Dave is talking about. And if we could figure out a way to overcome that, then more people will say, Poetry isn't one of those fields like rocket science or like uh, this theory or that, intro to logic, where you have to learn the discourse in order to be able to be part of the conversation. Poetry is actually about that problem. Mm -hmm. And if we can convey that poetry is about that problem, then we can be more inclusive and people won't drop out quite so much. And uh, it's a devastating thing to have said because we, haven't, we clearly haven't figured out how to do that as the participation rate declines because people feel more and more like they can't get in. Which is why we do the office hours and the webcasts with no agenda at all so that people feel like they can talk in any way they want. Like the person, um, sorry, I want to make sure I use her name, Kim Harrison, who engaged uh, with Jess saying, look, I'm 40 now, I got kids and a pet and a house, and I, but can I be part of this? And the answer is yes. Okay. Three tweets, three comments, and then um, it's actually Lily and Amarisa's turn to comment okay. on the comments. <laughs> um, well, first I wanted to say, um, Jeremy noticed that I'm wearing my hair down today, so thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy also <laughs> said, can't concentrate on poetry looking because at I'm that Gabe's cat. cat. <laughs> it was very sweet. Um, so hi, Jeremy. No, uh, um, Gabe's cat, right, Gabe's cat, sorry. Um, so first, like, just an invitation for us to talk. Colleen Knight... Um, said please she, that she can't join us today but please let us know how the essays are going so just a reminder that's a topic we could talk about today yep essays um i really liked uh sanjeev connected the sort of conversation that you and davy had at the beginning of um <laughs> the webcast he said quoting D davy humans are relational attributing the quote to Teflon T.A. Davy Niddle. Um, <laughs> then, but he adds, I'm still thinking of what Kate Colby called rhizomatic this morning. We are relational indeed. So, And then followed up, mm -hmm. the, Sanjeev followed up, the shimmer, this rhizomic, relational, mm -hmm. magical community. Yep, so I guess... I think we're going to meet Sanjeev in Boston, aren't we? So excited. Can't wait. Mm. Hi, Sanjeev. <laughs> hey, Sanjeev. Got any restaurant recommendations? <laughs> hint, hint. Um, okay, so that's an invitation to talk about um, rhizomatic and something that Kate talked about last week. Yep. Um, and then finally, our former face-to-face um, -face version of ModPo graduate student, uh, B. Huff Hunter. Yeah. She's been making Working a lot at of... home today, not doing work, but hanging out with ModPo. <laughs> She's Oops. been doing a lot of really great tweets. Um, so these are all from the hashtag ModPo Live. Um, but I like this question that she proposes in this most recent tweet. Um, you know that aphorism that people often get annoyed by things in other people that they're most ashamed of in themselves, mm -hmm. so that aphorism, do you think that that applies to art and poems as well? Mm. So do we find annoying what we are worried we is like are holding in ourselves? Mm. So That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, maybe two comments, and then we're going to go to the phone, and we'll ask Lily and Amaris to respond to any of it. There are many great comments in the forums. Um, a lot of folks able to join us c due to this very uh, agreeable, Convenient. agreeable time. Yeah, the, the South African Modpo people were celebrating this because it's 4 p.m. there, and they really, in Cape Town, they're really happy. Yeah. So. Um, so one comment that I'll read from Susan about 13 Ways Looking Blackbird that I love and think is great, and then I have one question that I thought might be a useful sort of like, let's back up and just like think about images and writ large if that's useful. Mm -hmm. um, so Susan writes, um, after watching the video discussion of Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird and listening to the comments on the various poems, I had a final thought about the 13th uh, you know, sort of stanza or section. Mm -hmm. I suddenly realized that the Blackbird is mentioned in each poem. Each She says poem, but I think she means section because they're individual parts of the one poem. Yeah. Um, and sometimes isn't actually there, but is still perceived or imagined. However, in the final section... We may actually be seeing the blackbird vanish before our eyes, the snow falling, gently covering it, its blackness disappearing into white as it sits on the bow, until, of course, it explodes up, snow scattering, winging wow. triumphantly away into the distance to become the subject of our imagination, our discussions now and future, and perhaps even other poems. Wow. So good. Really good. So, Susan, what a great 
Wow, kind is that Bert, Bertel, Susan Bertolini or no, Susan, Susan with no last name? Susan, yeah. Susan, no last okay. name. All right, let's let's go to the phone call, and then I'll ask Lily and Amaris to comment on anything that's been mentioned in the last five minutes. Calling from North Carolina, we have our friend John Owen. Ah, John. John, John, can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning, yeah. Mr. Radio Voice. So, back to Marianne Moore and poetry. Yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. Do you have a, a question or comment for us? Comment, I guess. Not till the poets among us can be literalists to the imagination. Right. And that's in quotes. Above insolence and triviality and can present for inspection, quote, imaginary gardens with real toads in them. That's right. Shall we have it? And those are great lines. It's kind of interesting about poetry that she eventually cut it down to just a couple of lines. She she cut the poem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real... I th What I'd like to do, John, is ask some of the folks here to respond to this concept of imaginary gardens with real toads in them, if you don't mind. And by the way, John, you're getting... You're the second caller, and you're getting a copy of Julia Block's book of poetry called Valley Fever. Would you like a copy of this if we mailed it to you? Sure, I guess I'll have to give somebody my mailing address. Okay, so Chris, I think, will be able to get your mailing address. So we'll be, uh, give him your mailing address, and then please hang up, and we'll respond, and you can listen to us uh, respond on the air. Okay. All right, thanks. Have a great day, good day, John. Thanks. Okay, so um, Lily and Amaris, I invited you to do anything, <laughs> but if, if one of those things you can do is to comment on imaginary gardens mm -hmm. with real toads in them, that'd be great. If not... You can kick that can down the road, and I'll ask Davy to do it. <laughs> kick that um, toad down the road. Oh, no. Oh, oh. not the toad again. Oh. <laughs> um, we people are so mad at us about that toad. But that's, that's week six. We won't worry about that. <laughs> um, I always love that line. I think it's one of those great, um, like, be brought up aphorisms. It is almost an aphorism, meaning, like, you know, self sort of a self contained wise statement or something. Yeah. Um, because you, it's like you're being confronted with the reality of something and then you're using creative thinking or poetry um, as a way to envision these, uh, envision X, envision other people's thinking about the object in front of you. Right. Um, like thinking back to what Ambrose and you were talking about about poetry as a medium like yeah. so okay you know that there's got a there's there are some fixed objects in the world which is in a way a response to people who would say like poetry is too like fairies in the sky whatever like you know right. not not re not grounded enough in right. reality it's That's like right. poetry is actually this thing that is made up of real grounded objects as well as um a creative aura, maybe the garden, maybe the imaginary garden is connected to the aura mm. you and Gabe were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, their poetry contains both of those elements, like mm. a grounded element and then an, a, a um, more imaginary, outward looking, um, yeah. creative realm around the fixed object. Very cool. Amaris, do you want to follow that up or say anything in response to the comments or tweets? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I kind of think of imagism as a reaction uh, and a rebellion against all the you know, stereotypical idealized images of the poetry that came before in romanticism. And so um, rejecting the vagueness of those idealized images, vague because they don't exist, mm -hmm. and instead uh, a validation of the ordinary, the imperfect, which is only ordinary um, if we kind of set it aside and forget about it what makes them extraordinary, and this is kind of riffing on what Davey was saying, is the act of us bringing our attention to it, bringing that relational element. Um, it's our insight, our experience mm -hmm. that endows that ordinary object with meaning. And so this makes me think of one of um, our forum participants, who I'm not going to remember who said it, unfortunately, um, was talking about the encounter and had a, a beautiful um, description of what that poem evoked in her in terms of memory. Um, and she said, I don't even want to an analyze the poem. It's so beautiful. It had such a visceral impact on me. I just want to leave it at this. Mm, and good. so that um, 
makes me kind of think of, you know, the imaginary garden with the real toads and also what Lily was saying is that our experience is grounded in a physical sensation or um, some kind of um, visceral experience that's hard to put into words that somehow a poem in no way that I don't think literature or anything that, you know, makes direct semantic meaning um, can touch in us just because it is the unsayable. Um, and that's what evokes the imaginary garden of associations that we find so kind of liberating and you don't need to have any kind of discourse or any particular interpretation to get it right. It's the fact of you engaging that makes it right and makes it extraordinary in itself. Oh, Maurice, I, um, I'm so um, head over heels for all of you. Um, we have made this completely unrehearsed, improvised conversation with help from people all over into a single essay, right, that started with the shimmering. Um, if somebody would just transcribe this and then we would all co-author it, we should be able to get it published because <laughs> I, I just think we've collaborated on some real step forward in our own thinking about this. Now, having praised you that way, let me ask for everyone, except for Lily and Amaris, who just spoke to it, I want to go all the way around, and I want you to riff briefly, we're talking like a phrase or a sentence, on imaginary gardens with real toads in them in relation to what we're trying to do with poetry here in the course and in this week. I'll invite you to say something about what that means. I'll invite you to substitute garden and toads, imaginary X with real Y in it, I'll invite you to, to think about what it would be like to reverse the terms real gardens with imaginary toads, which is what most people think poetry is. <laughs> I'll invite you to do anything. So we're going to start with Jess, and we're going to go around to the table, skipping Lily. Then we're going to go to the hangouts and go around and um, skip Amaris, who just spoke. So Jess, quick thought. What's it make you think of? And no pressure, because this is an essay we're going to publish. Sure, of course. <laughs> um... I'm a big fan of Moore. I'm glad that we're having this chance. Uh, Marianne Moore, yeah. Marianne, Marianne Moore to talk about this idea of imaginary gardens with real toads. And um, to me, this is a sort of um, version of like exactitude with a difference, this combination of the imaginary and the real. Sounds like Gertrude Stein. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I think what this means to me is that um, oftentimes the spaces that we want to live in may not exist yet, and that the space that the poem gives us is not what we live in, um, but like we live with what the poem gives us. Oh my God, you're so good. <laughs> God, that was good. Amber Rose and Jason. How are you going to follow that, Amber Rose? Yeah, I know. I'm like, we're, we're you can just really say what You can just lot. say what was so great about that if you'd want, but... Respond to imaginary gardens with real toads in them. What do you want from a poem? What's that real toad for you? I'm not going to answer that question, but I I'm figured say you wouldn't. Else. I was just filling space. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, this conversation is making me think about the words entanglement and perception, um, and the kind of entanglement that we're constantly negotiating, which is trying to imagine something other than what we're experiencing. Um, and But that those things have to re remain really interconnected or else the balance sort of tips and you can be kind of out of your mind. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Jason, your thought on imagine imaginary gardens with real toads. You want to do some XY substitutions, imaginary X with real Ys? Um, We've done this before. With how about imaginary poems with uh, real words in them? I love it. Do another one. <laughs> I love um, it when we do this. It's once every couple of years we do this, and it produces fireworks. Um, imaginary... Imagination with real reality in them. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Um, imaginary Mod Poe with real people in them. <laughs> imaginary Jason with real Jason in it, <laughs> in him. Um, Either one more or 
a brief version of the comment you were going to make because I re derailed you. That's okay. The comment I was going to make was simply to read a little bit more from what follows because I think that what's at stake here is the word real. What because and and this in a way ties together I think all that we've been talking about that reality is as Davy said relational and that if it she more continues to say that if you defy the critics and are interested in the raw material of poetry and all its rawness, that which is, on the other hand, genuine, then you're interested in poetry. Mm. And that, I think that that raw material is related to, the, the raw material of poetry is imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have someone on the phone, but I want to continue this exercise, so you're limited to one sentence. Davy, imaginary gardens with real toads. A sentence with two parts, Al. Uh, part one, uh, imaginary gardens with real toads points to um, what's both universal and situated about perceiving objects. On the one hand, we all have experiences of perception. On the other hand, um, our situated experience changes uh, how familiar our, a garden or a toad is to you. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, gardens and toads, as what we're talking about, uh, opens us up to think about um, poems as having climatological information of uh, the acts of perceiving and situating and thinking through uh, our environment is what we've been talking about, oh, man. and which uh, offers us the opportunity to think about poems as ways of perceiving, perceiving, perceiving environments as they change. That we might think about a poem as a environmental strategy or as a climatological strategy. Yeah, you're 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 blowing all the fuses. That's right, um, Anna. You're next, but let me comment and say, uh, you know, the cult of the imagination, which is what poetry was in the modern period, mm -hmm. isn't gonna do much. It's not gonna help if the real toads are dead. Um, imagination is pretty good, but reality is inside there, and so we, we're going to wind up having to do imaginary gardens and imaginary toads if we're not fucking careful. Oh my god, what's happening? Anna, quickly, <laughs> sentence. That was nine sentences, by the way, but that's okay. Sorry, Elf. My sentence is to go watch the video in Mod Poe Plus that we did on this poem, because uh, yeah. we actually look at all the various revisions of this poem that Marianne Moore made over the years, mm. and we look at her archive, and we're in spaces. Actually, part of the video we recorded is in a reconstruction of her living room. Right. So, really cool spot to be like on location, right. to be thinking about. A mile from here. Imaginary yeah. gardens and real toads. Great. All right. Max, Gabe, Erica, Dave. Max, Gabe, Erica, Dave. C comment on this in any way. You can go far, far away from this now. Max, first. Uh, I love the substitution exercise. I think we should do it all the time. I'm going to stay to one sentence, so semicolon. I think um, <laughs> the, uh, the, while imaginary gardens with real toads is a great way of thinking about modernist poetry, if you substitute it so it's imaginary cities with real people, it becomes suddenly very much about postmodernist fiction. Whoa, really helpful heuristic there. Fabulous. Gabe, your thought? Yeah, this will be a sentence. Um, the poets that we're working with this week who believe that poetry is a record of the real, as in it's a medium, and the poets who we will meet later who believe that poetry is the translation of the surreal, like from another world, say Jack Spicer, Ginsberg, and Waldman, who believe it's a medium, as in like the Long Island medium, are actually in perfect agreement. Whoa, yeah. Gabe, this is outrageous. Erica, we are going to transcribe this. Erica? I am thinking about Gertrude Stein and her portraits, and my contribution is a sentence from her piece, Portraits and Repetition, which is, I kept wondering as I talked and listened all at once, 
I wondered, is there any way of making what I know come out as I know it, come out not as remembering? I found this very exciting, and I began to make portraits. Mm. Oh, that's fabulous. Dave, your last thought on this, and then we're going to go to the phone. Just thinking about a substitution. Um, imaginary gray-green leaves with real bright green broken glass. That's really cool. Great reference to um, Lines by Williams, which we don't talk about often enough. I think it's actually quite a subtle poem. Thank you all for engaging me in that weird little exercise. Um, who's on the phone? We're going to take one last call and talk about it, and then we're going to wrap up. We have Mandana calling in. Today. Oh, Mandana. I'm sorry. Right. Let me say that one more time. My mic was off. We okay. have Mandana calling. Mandana. <laughs> Much better. Hello, Mandana. Hi, Al. How are you today? Very well. You know, when I posted that YouTube clip from the June 2019 webcast, YouTube sort of grabs an image to make it the, the, the profile screenshot image, and it was you. <laughs> Actually, I think yes, it, and that's, yeah. it was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life was having some people contact me and say, is that you? Is that you? <laughs> oh, yes. I thought it was very much you, <laughs> but I, I apologize because I posted it, and there was your face, and I didn't ask you permission ahead of time. But no, uh, we the, can the pull funny, it down if the you funny want. Part, the funny part is, I wonder why I'm leaning so much to the side. I look like I have a like, major structural damage on my left side. <laughs> but. I think the poetry put a dent in that, you know, and that's what happened. <laughs> uh, Mandana, thank you. I want to say publicly thank you what, I've thanked you, what I've told you in private emails. Thank you for organizing the New York team. Uh, for doing that. I know you had a, a really successful get-together recently. Um, and also, we're going, the whole crew, Anna, do you have the date in your head? In sometime in October, we're going to do a live webcast in at the October Morgan 30th. Library. October 30th. October 30th. I hope that's, it's like pre-Halloween. That's going to be a spooky webcast. Spooky webcast at the um, Morgan. And, and, that, and I believe that Mandana will be there. I bet you will, won't you? Of course I will, Al. Okay, good. Do you have a comment or question? Uh, it's so interesting. The question that I called in with, you all kind of started to address in, in your conversation, speaking of spooky, but um, it, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, this has been such kind of a profound and deep webcast, which we don't necessarily always do with imagism year after year, and uh, I've been taking a lot of notes on it. And I thought maybe at this point it might also be important or interesting, um, as Erica already kind of pointed out, to talk about how the kind of rebellion that we're seeing in this week leads us into a very different kind of rebellion next week. I know people always seem to be so fearful of Stein, and I actually think it's better to kind of look at it as one of the most fun weeks of the course. Mm. But how do, we, how do we go from here to Stein? Because on paper, the poetry seems so different and so much more challenging. And I'm kind of trying to posit that it isn't. It's just, it's like putting on a different pair of glasses with a different lens. But it, it's still that poetic lens. Uh, Mandana, would, since you're the last caller today, would you stay on the line? And then maybe I'll come around back to you to respond to the responses. Love to. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, so uh, Mandana, who really knows this course as well as absolutely anybody and is really acting as a kind of agent for cheerleading for next week, which she knows from experience we need to do because Stein is next week and the rate of participation drops precipitously <laughs> as people read the first Stein and think, what the fuck? They do. They do, and we don't want them to. So Mandana is suggesting appropriately that there is a line of continuity from week three to week four, from imagism to Stein, which gets us back to shimmering. So I would like to invite some people. Um, I'm going to say um, Lily, uh, Lily, Jess, and Amber Rose, uh, and then um, Erica and Amaris. Uh, to just quickly comment on either bat, che cheerlead for Stein or just talk about the co possible continuity from this week to Stein. 
So I think it was going to be Amber Rose, Lily, and Jess. Why don't we start with Lily on that? Do you mind, Lily? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, I love Stein Week. I think it flows really naturally from um, if you are frustrated in this week, as like Gabe um, pointed us to in the beginning of like whether or not we can really trust the um, the what the imagists say they are and wanting to accomplish. I kind of think that Stein. Um, accomplishes like takes that to a more of an extreme like she really fixates more on the aura of the object and less on the object itself but in a similar way I feel like we talk about um that she describes with precision even while she's making language that we might almost not recognize as language so mm. it's kind of an interesting progression if um you think about I'm thinking about tender buttons if you think about her approach to writing about objects Thank you, Lily. That's very helpful. Amber Rose, your thought on this? Yeah, um, I quickly flipped to the Stein Week and I just opened up one poem and that poem was a long dress. And I just want to read this one line. What is the wind? What is it? I think that line, I think that line, I love the way I can go from our conversation today to that mm -hmm. line in particular, mm -hmm. thinking about, like, to just ask the question, what is the wind? And to ask it again, what is it? Yeah. Well, to what is the wind? Yeah, what is this thing that I can't see, that I can feel, that I can use some unit of measure, right. but it slips out of my grasp, right. it's here and it's not. Um, and yeah. Stein is interested in that play in the same way that the I imagists are interested in this problem Great. of perception. And uh, th thank you so much. And, and translate it into sort of basic introductory modern poetics, um, you know, the, in the most basic way of thinking about this stepwise. You, you, in week three, you get uh, what is the mug? What is the mug? What is mug? Boom. What is that thing? What is that relation? What do I mean when I denote mug? How simple and clarifying can that be? To what is the... Right. <laughs> and that's a fucking big step, but it's actually quantitatively a step, not qualitatively a step. So thank you. That's pretty cool. Um, Jess? Sure. Um... <laughs> One of the things that I think is very important to remember about Stein is that she wrote very insistently and deliberately from and of her own everyday experience without a lot of contextual clues or historical references. In fact, she worked very hard to like detach her own experience from all of that stuff. And the essay that I referred to in my office hour prompt, A Common Sense, by Lynn Higinian is actually about Stein's idea of the commonplace. And one of the things that's so difficult about Stein is that there is a sense of ordinariness, but it's also always Stein's own sense of her ordinariness. And to, take, to connect this to what Erica read from Portraits and Repetition, which is really useful, this idea of Stein wanting to convey somehow out of herself what she knows. And Stein says elsewhere in a place that I can't recall that in an interview maybe, um, that nobody understands anyone. This is what she says, nobody understands anyone. The most that you can do is feel the vitality of knowing. So Stein is hard. But maybe what we can do is like feel the vitality with which she mm. knows what she knows. Mm. And maybe that's enough. Mm. Boy, that's really good. Um, the next time I encounter a friend, let's say on the sidewalk, I'm going to le listen less to the content that we're coming up with to update and catch up with each other. And I'm going to try to read the vitality of the connection and that will be a content in itself. Um, thanks, Gertrude. Um, Erica and then Amaris on this, on this issue that Mandana raises of the possible relationship rather than disruption from week three to week four. So um, Erica first, then Amaris. Well, I think that what Stein does as far as a transition from week to week is she takes um, she takes the image and makes it into something that one could see as being totally objective and very much contingent on 
you know, who the reader reading is and the time of the composition or the time of the reading. Um, so I would emphasize Stein as being an invitation to enjoy language. Yes, that's terrific. And I'm sure we're going to say a lot of, more about that next week, a week from today. Uh, Maurice, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I was going to say that um, we kind of are moving away from the serious imagist project of rendering uh, images with exact language into kind of more a, a moving slipperiness with Stein, mm -hmm. um, which focuses our attention actually on defamiliarizing the language itself, the words we use themselves. And so I would approach Stein actually in a really um, open, playful way, especially the the poem, If I Told Him a Completed Portrait of Picasso, I find it just be so fun to listen to every time I encounter it. Um, and so to not be, I guess, like scared by the defamiliarization of language and just see it as an experience, see how it makes you feel. And I, I, I love what um, just just uh, quoted from Stein, to see the vitality of the, the poem in that way. Fantastic. Uh, Mandana, hi, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Any thoughts on all the thoughts? Want to add a final thought? Oh, well. Well, my first thought is I'd like to know what kind of superfood you all had for breakfast today. I don't today. know what is going on. <laughs> Actually, I've had lack. Lack of food, lack of sleep. It seems to be the thing. <laughs> this is like, like three webcasts in one. Yeah, I, um, I agree with you, you, by the way. Kudos to everyone, including you, Mandana. Oh, thank you, Al. But um, so you all have me actually thinking, oh, it's, it's brilliant. I'm now very excited about Stein uh, coming up in a few days. But you're having me think about um, the fact that one of the things you've all talked about throughout the day to day for me is that poetry is a kind of lens, as it were. And I mean that more literally. I'm of an age now where I have multifocal lenses in my glasses, something for long distance, something for middle distance, something for close reading. And maybe week to week, we're exercising different muscles as far as how we're examining the language that we're examining. And sometimes we're looking at it from a distance. Sometimes it's much closer to us. And sometimes you almost even have to take your glasses off and get the magnifying glass out mm -hmm. and look very deeply into, into the actual language, into the punctuation. Uh, into syllables, and maybe Stein is part of that. I'm not sure if I'm right about that. I think Stein is a lot more about precision and not as much about the long view. And the long view feels like that's where narrative is. And the further we go along, the less we're thinking about narrative and the more we're thinking about um, of language, its components, and then what you can do with those components and still consider it language. That's beautifully put. I recommend that you um, go to your optometrist, give back your long distance glasses <laughs> and your middle distance glasses, and retain only your close reading glasses. Um, and when you do, and when you do, the imaginary gardens can be seen in your head, but the real toad will be seen by a close up look. Oh, well, I tried that little riff. I'm not so sure that was such a wise idea. Okay, but anyway, um, thank you, Mandana. We love you thank so you. much, thank and um, we're going to see you soon. Um, we're yeah. going to wrap up with final words, and your final words should be brief, and everybody gets one, and uh, it can be just a plug, although plugging office hours, you needn't do it. Every, let me just say, everybody, office hours, check it out. It's fun. All right, so I've relieved you of that responsibility unless you really want to repeat it. So we're going to go alternately around the table and Jason, but then into the, um, into the hangouts, and I'll call you out before when you're on deck. So we're going to start with um, Anna, and then we'll go to uh, Max second. Um, Final thoughts, Anna? Yeah, I'll just hop in on this question of, of the transition from Imagism and Williams in week three into Stein in week four, just to um, sort of quoting from um, John Ashbery's essay on Stein's work, Stanzas and Meditation, um, which is a work that we don't actually read in, in Mod Poe, I don't think. But um, if Imagism is interested in looking at the static, in looking at the object as it is, um, Stein is interested in, um, and this is quoting from Ashbery, um, but it's not usually events which interest Stein. Rather, it is their way of happening. Mm. 
The Very. poem is a hymn to possibility, a celebration of the fact that the world exists, that things can happen. And I think if we think about tender buttons, it's not just about that things can happen, it's that objects exist. And we have to think about how it was that we learned to describe them. Mm. Really a nice, if the essay that results from the transcription of this webcast were to end there, that would be the perfect way to do it. But unfortunately, you're the first of many, so <laughs> let's see how this goes. Max, final thoughts? I just want to plug the first Chicago meetup, which will be this Saturday, September 28th at 11 a.m. Central Time at the Harold Washington Library downtown, sixth floor. Um, I'll be at the top of the escalators. Uh, if anybody wants to join, you can find me there. Maybe you'll descend the escalator and declare your candidacy for the presidency of the United <laughs> States. Yes, I've, I do that every time I'm in that library. And by the way, Harold Washington... He, he won the first person of color to be the mayor of Chicago, and his slogan was, know it? I don't actually know what his slogan was. No. It's our turn now. It was a big moment. Um, we're going to go to um, Lily and then to Gabe. Final thoughts. Um, my plug for is as a preparation for Stein Week. Um, it's really simple, just if you're reading and getting frustrated, try switching to reading the poems to yourself out loud. Um, it's like similar to what Amaris was saying about listening to Portrait of Picasso, but um, it really makes a difference and it might help you get through something difficult just to listen as, and try to turn off reading for a second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hear it as music first, why not, right? Yeah. Um, Gabe, your final thought? Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, well, first, I just I want to say that I think Lily is a hundred percent right. Like Stein is so much fun. I mean, I, I, she really can be just an incredible amount of fun. And I think one of the ways she's fun is just like reading those poems out loud or hearing her read them because you hear um, the Pablo Picasso poem, her reading it out loud, and it's clear that she's having a great time. So uh, this is me disagreeing. But secondly, I was going to say. I don't have much of a final word, but uh, year two of grad school starts for me in a week. Uh, I'm reading Kant right now, and let's just say it's nice to talk about these things a little differently. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you so much. Davey, your final thought? My final thought uh, is uh, a wonderful sentence from the disability scholar Robert McCruer um, by way of the transition from week three to week four. That sentence is... In contrast to an able-bodied culture that holds out the promise of a substantive but paradoxically always elusive ideal, a queer disabled perspective would resist delimiting the kinds of bodies and abilities that are acceptable or that will bring about change. We've been talking this week a lot about different practices of perception and something that I'm going to talk about in my office hour today and throughout the this time around the course is uh, what's the relationship between the practices of perception and the kinds of bodies who do perceiving mm -hmm. and the uh, ways of embodied perceiving that uh, the Mod Po poems help us uh, think about and center and uh, champion as important. Thank you, Davey. What time is that office hour? Uh, that's uh, <laughs> usually at four. Today's at 3.30. 3.30. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we're going to go to Erica, followed by Amber Rose. Final thoughts. Um, my final thought is a continuation of my plug for Stein Week, which is um, thinking about William James, who is Stein's teacher and a big influence on her. And he has this amazing line from somewhere in the Principles of Psychology, where he talks about um, a feeling of if. And I would encourage you to keep that in mind as you read Stein and just open up yourself as a reader to possibilities if you let go of kind of looking for narration or anything of that sort. That's so a cool. feeling of if, a feeling of but, a feeling of by. Mm. And those things have feelings, absolutely, or convey mm -hmm. them. Um, Chris, I'm going to listen. We're going to get Gertrude's in the, in the audio here. Um, here goes. This is uh, in the spirit of all those TAs who've just reminded us that we should be listening to Stein as music. Exactly as resembling, exactly resembling, exactly in resemblance, exactly a resemblance, exactly and resemblance. For this is so because. Now actively repeat it all, now actively repeat it all, now actively repeat it all. Have hold and hear actively repeat it all. I judge, judge. 
as a resemblance to him. Who comes first? Napoleon the first. Who comes to? Coming, coming to. Who goes there? As they go, they share. Who shares all? All is as all as... Just as put as it on the hi-fi and sit around and <laughs> have a glass of wine and call it music. And when all your family comes home, just say, I'm listening to music. Do you want to listen to the music? Okay, let's listen to the music. Um, Amber Rose, followed by Dave. My final word is a quote, a line from Toni Morrison's uh, Nobel Prize, 1993 uh, Nobel Prize speech in literature. Um, Don't tell us what to believe, what to fear. Show us belief's wide skirt and the stitch that unravels fear's call. You, old woman, blessed with blindness, can speak the language that tells us only what language can, how to see without pictures. Language alone protects us from the scariness of things with no name. Language alone is meditation. Wow, it's mm. there's Stein in the Morrisonian speech. That's really good. Thank you so much. We're going to go to Dave Poplar, followed by Jason. Final thoughts? Um, in addition to uh, putting Gertrude Stein on the record player, um, as you, everyone suggested, which I think as is a great Joe idea. Joe Biden might I, say. I would mention <laughs> there's something in uh, the, uh, on the site uh, to check out to the dance choreography mm-hmm. uh, performance to Stein's If I Told Him. That's yeah. in the week four material. Uh, which is just a short video clip of a uh, modern dance troupe performing to that poem. And that just gives another dimension of interpretation right. of the poem using using your yes. multi, multifocal lenses. Uh, it really helped open it up for me in a way that yeah. I, even just listening didn't. Yeah, and it gets close to what Davey's been saying um, because there's it's one thing to stu- use the inter-arts analogy to music, but might may, it may be that a better inter-arts analogy is to body movement. Right to be able to express signs, signs as in linguistic theory, through the movement of the body as a vocabulary. So that's cool. Um, So let's go to Jason and then Amaris and Jess. Final thought, Jason? I think um, I, I endorse everything that everyone has said. Without exception. Without exception and I think that the question of the body, the body is where it, 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 it's between bodies that language occurs. And the different, the, that language's paradox is that it occurs between two different bodies. Oh, say that again. The, the paradox of language is that it occurs between two different bodies. Um, True. I hope I'm, I'm being faithful to what Davey is, is pointing towards. Um, and I think... Also, it's important to remember with um, with Marianne Moore that one of her practices involves, like the, there, she has a poem called An Octopus, which is made out of, it's collaged from real material. About the octopus. A, about the octopus, which happens to be the shape of the snow on the top of the mountain. And that it, that maneuver is something that um, we can experience with st- with Stein, it's like to, with Stein, it's to 
enter into the the code of of language itself like the the background of what's occurring mm -hmm. thank you jason amazing as always um Amaris, then jess then al Amaris, hello hello so i'm still thinking about the um last stanza of the marianne moore poem and i'm going to take the liberty of condensing one line of it which is if you demand the raw material of poetry and all its rawness, then you are interested in poetry. And so I think you can't get more raw than with Stein next week taking language, the raw material of poetry, mm. and its rawness and seeing it language as objects, celebrating words mm. as objects. Um, Thank then you, you can be interested in poetry. Yeah. You, Amaris, and really all of my colleagues here show such joy uh, in talking about this, right? It is a thing in itself that we can be, we keep talking about Stein as a great pleasure. Um, it goes all the way back to Davies, my little colloquy with him about, you know, how are you? Oh, how are you? Oh, and then Davy, wise ass, says, <laughs> it's okay if I turn it back on you because, as Jason said, language has to be relational or it's just going to sit inert. Um, Jess, Final thought. You started this. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm very excited to watch this Steinian uh, dance mm -hmm. performance. Mm. Um, I think a lot about dance, um, something that dance does. It makes space around bodies and between them, which is also where language um, exists, as Jason put it so elegantly. Um, and so following that, my final thought goes back to this idea um, that Moore gives us of a place for the genuine in poetry. Um, and there is this sense of poetry holding open a place for something, for what Moore calls the genuine, um, for something that's not necessarily real or imagined um, wholly, but like living or vital. Um, and for Stein, um, what happens in that space is, uh, expansive, right? The difference is, is spreading. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm excited to encounter that. that thank you. Thank you, time. Jess, so much. Um, a couple of thank yous and then, uh, uh just want to quote, uh, or make two final thoughts. For myself, uh, thank you to Phil and John and Mandana for calling. Those were really great and very much in sequence. Well, I have to say, John, when I first heard that you were mentioning a poem that we really haven't talked about much, that's relatively new to Mod Pop Plus, the Marion Moore, I thought, oh no, this is gonna be different and distinct and it turned out to be just the thing we needed to, to cause us to say fresh things about week three. So that's funny how Mod Pop keeps going along. Um, uh, so th thanks to the three of you, and uh, also we will, we will, I'm committed to this idea, we will find someone to make a transcript of this, and we will publish it in Jacket 2, and then we will link it forever to Week 3 Modpo Plus as a way for people to really, not just Modpo people, but others to see what collaborative thinking about this imagism, which seems like an old stale subject, can be, can be like. So uh, that was really great. Um, and thank you to Chris and Zach. Uh, once again, for just making this whole thing so ridiculously seamless. I want to end by quoting Margaret from the forums and also, um, gee, quoting myself, I guess, on MOOCs. Um, Margaret, Margaret, nine hours ago, uh, thanks for the replies. Margaret had posted something. Uh, her pronoun is she. I can tell from context, so I'll use she. Uh, just posted on William's lines over in that subforum, and I'm thinking what I said over there, I need to keep to rep repeating to myself that this poetry is not about narrative or message meaning, which I, which I tend to expect to look for, but more like pure music, which is to be experienced in itself as an experience. It's almost Steinian to be experienced in itself as an experience, not as the teller of a tale, as in a 19th century work. And then Margaret continues, I just read some Williams, um, 
some Stevens Blackbird bits to my husband and realized from his response that other people see so differently from me, which is the why, W-H-Y, of Modpo. Mm -hmm. So I can hear about how others see and learn to see with new eyes. I am more willing this year than in times past, I think, though at times frustrated with my initial non-reaction to some of the poems. Um, there's a thread somewhere about Blackbird giving the Emily Dickinson reaction of taking the top of my head off. I confess to more bafflement than awe at initial encounter with some of these poems. Oh, my flaws and ineptitudes are showing, and I say, no, not your ineptitude, but your, your generous communitarian aptitude, I would say. Thank you, Margaret, for participating in Modpo. Uh, and finally, a quote from myself, um, something I said about MOOCs, and we'll conclude and wish you well for the week as we move to week four, and next week our live webcast will be at 8 p.m., which is rather better to the folks west of us than to many of the folks east of us. We're sorry, it's a late night for us, but it'll be just easier for a lot of people in the east and midwest coming home from work, and even for people on the west coast coming home from work, although they're sitting in traffic. Um, and we'll send out a link to maybe, is there, an, Zach, an audio-only way to see the web, to hear the webcast? Not really, we'll think that one through. So here, here I, here, here's me about MOOCs. Some folks think of an open online course, so-called MOOCs, as one-way instruction, as delivery-only teaching. We at ModPo think otherwise. Join us for today's webcast, I wrote earlier today, and see that we are there, that we are here, that we are alive, not DOA like most MOOCs. And present tense, we are present tense, and we want to talk with you about the poems. Our webcasts have no set agenda, huh? And our responses to your questions and comments are improvised and collaborative. I feel like a genius having said that before this incredible collaboration. In other words, we are coming to you live and in person from live. It's Saturday night from Kelly Writer's House. Check us out. We are your poetry pals. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great next couple of days in week three, and we'll see you in week four. Bye. Mm. Wow. wow.